السلام علیکم وی آر گوئنگ ٹو اسٹارٹ آر ڈسکشن وتھ پرائسنگ آف نان کسٹمائزڈ پروڈکٹس وی ہیو سین ان پریویس کیسز ویئر کسٹمائز پروڈکٹس آر انوالوڈ دیٹ وی ہیو پرائس دیم ان اے وے ان وچ ٹو کور دا انٹائر کاسٹ ان کیس آف نان کسٹمائز پروڈکٹس وی ہیو سیڈ نان کسٹمائز آر دوز پروڈکٹس which are made generally made available to everyone these are not made for any specific requirement these are not made for any specific customer overall production of products similar products that are introduced into the market for purchased by the general public in this case therefore we expect that the number of products being produced is going to be large and the price of these products will be a matter for the firms according to their size in the market we talked about the market leaders there will be the price setters and of course the smaller firms and other market participants which are going to be the price takers so of course the pricing of non customized products is going to be a matter for the price leaders If you are the leader, you will somehow set the price, set the trend, and others will probably follow the same pricing. Why is it that the market leader should set the price? The thing is, if somebody else sets his own price, and market leader is the one that has the largest share of the market, and he doesn't follow that price, so the largest section of the market is not going to follow a price and others also will not so the market leaders are the ones who will generally set the price what is the information therefore now available to them of course they have their own costing systems they know their own costs they know what it costs to produce what it costs to market what it costs to transport and all those things but they do not at the moment know at what price what quantities are going to sell of course there are estimates and they all make estimates and these things are going to be based to a large extent on estimation of price and the leaders estimate of what would be the likely quantities at the different prices so on the one hand the price is unknown Uh, and on the other hand the selling quantity is unknown so there are two unknown quantities now these are the factors which are faced by the market leaders and they will then carry on a certain amount of analysis and a certain amount of estimation to arrive at what price they should charge pricing of non customized products A market leader must make pricing decisions for large and unknown volumes of a product that is sold to thousands of customers. An estimate of sales volume is required to determine the unit cost. Hence, two unknown sales price and sales volume. It is recommended that cost plus selling prices are estimated for a range of potential sales volumes. Now in addition to not knowing what quantities are likely to be sold at what selling price the firm is also faced with the situation that they need to estimate cost and as we have said there is a variable aspect of cost and there is a fixed aspect of cost and fixed aspect is then allocated onto uh, each unit in order to arrive at the unit price a unit cost now the unit cost comprises therefore of the variable and the fixed element the fixed element is basically an approximation an allocation it is the division of the cost by the expected volume if the manufacturer is not sure of his volume then the per unit cost of the fixed cost is also an uncertain amount 
So there is a slight dilemma in a way that as the quantities change, the per unit fixed cost will change. So the manufacturer is faced with this situation that he has to set the price and he has to have an estimate of cost and his total cost is will comprise of variable and fixed cost and the fixed cost will vary as the volume varies. The absorption of fixed overhead is on the basis of volume. As the volume changes, the per unit absorption will vary. Under these circumstances, therefore, it is recommended that the manufacturer should estimate the volume and the cost at different price levels. It is recommended that cost plus selling prices are estimated for a range of potential sales volumes. We have said cost plus selling prices. These are the, this is a method of arriving at the cost. This is the cost plus method at arriving at the cost uh, and basing the price on the cost. The cost plus basis of uh, pricing implies that we will look at the total cost and we'll add a suitable markup to cover profits and uh, facility charges and we will arrive at the cost. So therefore, the market leader will need to use his cost as a basis and then estimate on that basis the various different prices for different quantities. We will look at a case here. The Alipur company is launching a new product. Sales volume will be dependent on selling price, meaning the selling price goes up, volume goes down, selling price goes down, volume goes up. The best estimate is that demand is likely to range between 100,000 and 200,000 units provided the selling price is below rupees 100. The company has produced the following cost estimates and selling prices required to generate a target profit contribution of 2 million from the product. So the company, they have produced some cost estimates and selling prices that will be required to provide a contribution of 2 million. So in a minute we'll look at the detail of the costs that have been put together by the company at different levels. We are looking at a case. The case is where the company is producing to a large number of customers and users and it is going to identify a price. We are told that the quantities can vary anywhere from 100,000 to 200,000 providing the price is less than 100. Using a cost plus basis, the company can therefore make estimates at different prices and see and different quantities at different prices and see how the costs and revenues behave and try to judge what would be the most appropriate price. So they have set out a range of sales volumes starting from 100,000 going up to 200,000 and they have covered 120, 140, 160 and 180 as the various different intervals. Total costs have been estimated at 100 to be 10,000. The required profits are 2 million. So they have set themselves a target of profit. And when you add that cost to the profit, you arrive at the required sales. So this to sell 12,000 12, will be their target in order to achieve at the price of 100, at a volume of 100,000 to achieve a profit of 2,000. The required selling price is then going to be dividing the sales by the sales volume. That's 120 and the unit cost can be arrived at by dividing the total cost with the quantity sales volume. So we can see that in order to earn the 2 million profit set out as a target, the selling price, if that were to be 120, the sale volume needs to be 100,000. And as the price goes down, it can go down to 107, where the sales volume will need to be 120. And it can go down to 94, the sales volume required would be 140. 
together with, of course, the movement in costs that have been shown. So at the required uh, selling price of 85, they will need to sell 160,000 volume to generate the 2 billion profit. This forms an analysis of the firm's position of Alipur company. They have set themselves different information, starting from a sales volume of 100,000, going up to 200,000, with intervals of 20,000. They have estimated that at each of the given points after the interval, what would be the revenue and what would be the cost. When you give yourself a target profit, then you make an estimate of cost and add that profit to the cost and that gives you the revenue required. So, having estimated the revenue required, you arrive at what would be your uh, possible selling price. The Alipur company has produced estimates of total cost for a range of output levels. The information indicates sales volume and accompanying selling prices that are required to generate the target profit. The unit cost calculation indicates the break-even selling price. Management must assess the price with highest probability of generating the specified sales volume. So in this manner, this different information has been set out and at different price levels, the company has estimated what would be the selling price, what would be the cost, what would be the profit. The profit, of course, was a target and they have set themselves a fixed target of 2 million that at this target, they were then examining the different sales volumes and the different revenues and costs at these volumes. The unit cost in this case would represent the break-even cost, the break-even selling price. Here, if that was to be the revenue, then total cost would be equal to total revenue and that would be the break-even point. Break-even point we've discussed before, where total revenues are equal to total cost and there is no profit or loss situation. So the company had a different uh, range of volumes and arrived at the data. Now it will need to then find that level of price which is most likely to get the targeted volume at that price. Profit is the same. So as far as the profit objective is concerned, the company would be indifferent what price it chooses for its product given that the profit is going to be 2 million. So now it will then have to judge at that the different volumes that it is predicting at the different prices which is the most likely and the most realistic. And that should be the aim to set the product at that price and aim at getting at that volume which will provide the 2 million profit required for the company. The same cost schedule applies. In this case, we are now going to examine case B where the same cost schedule applies but the 2 million minimum profit does not apply. We are not required to have a margin of 2 million. Estimate of sales demand at different selling prices have been made based on market research. So now we have the different prices and we are on the basis of market research, we are told what would be the sales volume at the different prices. So at a price of 100, the potential price 120 and estimated sales revenue will be 12,000. The estimated sales volume at this potential price is 120 and the estimated sales revenue is 12,000. Estimated total cost is 10,800 and estimated profit is 1,200. When we look at the price of 90, that as a potential selling price, the estimated sales volume at this price would be 140,000 and the potential sales revenue would be 12,600 and the estimated total cost would be 11,200 giving an estimated profit of 1,500. So as the selling price goes down and it goes down to 60, we find that the total cost is 13,000 there and there is an estimated loss of 1,000. 
profits are maximized at a selling price of rupees 80 another pricing policy could be to sell at the lower price of rupees 70 to ensure a larger market share is obtained in future so in this case b we have eliminated the requirement of the 2 million profit and based on market research we are we are showing what would be the possible revenue and sales at the different price levels and that is going to then show us a varying profit at the different uh, selling prices and therefore the cost comparing with the cost related to it we have found that the profit was maximized at the price of 80 we have seen before a graphical representation that revenues and costs are not straight line functions which means they do not increase or decrease directly in proportion to quantity and therefore if there is a curve then there is going to be a point which will maximize the profits in this example of case b the profits are being maximized at a price of 80 so that would be a recommended or a suggested price for the company to set there may be cases however where a company chooses to set a price of 70 which is lower than the price that is going to give the maximum amount of profit but it may be that it, it estimates that at the price of 70 the revenues from the quantities are going to be larger and the quantities sold will be greater and it might be that they wish to have a greater volume and a greater volume and a greater presence and a greater market share so a strategy will be evolved and there could be various factors within uh, the strategy uh, to maximize and to attain the objectives of the company so for a period of time it might want to reduce the price so that it can increase the volume and the sales and then perhaps look for profits later on at a future period target costing in target costing the starting point is the determination of the target selling price next a standard or desired profit is deducted to get to a target cost for the product the aim is to ensure that future cost will not be higher than the target cost the stages involved in target costing can be summarized as below target costing is the third aspect we said of this pricing decisions here we said the first thing is to estimate sales revenue once that estimate of sales revenue has been arrived at a markup of profit is deducted and an estimate cost is arrived at and that is our target cost that is a calculation and it is a desire that the company should have that cost at that given sales revenue to give the required profit so then efforts will be made to ensure that actual costs then are going to not exceed the target cost so the targets are set the costs are set the advantage over here is that costs will remain within target to provide the desired profit controlling costs is not always a simple matter and an easy matter and therefore having a target in front gives the managers a challenge it gives them an objective and it gives them a target to reach and to achieve and to demonstrate their performance so therefore target setting gives you the advantage of giving you the desired profit from that given volume the stages in target costing therefore are stage 1 determine the target price which customers will be prepared to pay for the product stage 2 deduct a target profit margin from the target price to determine the target cost stage 3 estimate actual cost of the product stage 4 if estimated cost exceeds the target cost investigate ways of driving down the actual cost to the target cost four stages that have been described 
for implementing a target costing system. Starting with the selling price. The selling price and the estimate of the sales revenue. And then starting with a profit margin desired. So deducting the desired profit margin from the selling price to arrive at the target cost. And we have said then, if the target costs are not met and it seems that the actual cost might be more than the target costs, then it will be the desire and efforts of the company to find ways in which cost can be reduced. Those ways can be very different and it can uh, and vary depending on the product and the environment and the conditions. They may be able to cut down material cost or labor cost. They may need to re-engineer the product. They may need to uh, redesign the product and in such manner that the design will then incorporate some cost savings. So then that will be the basis in which uh, the target costs can be met and the desired profits can be achieved. The major attraction of target costing is that marketing factors and customer research provide the basis for determining selling price. This therefore is regarded as the major attraction. That in selling price, the selling price is being set by marketing factors and market research. Selling price, as we said, is a very essential and important decision. And if companies choose to set their selling price in an arbitrary manner, then the sales volume will not result and the desired objectives will not be met. And the company can run into difficulties. So a good way of setting selling price is to have market information, is to have market research. And this target costing, the first step is to set a selling price. When you are setting a selling price without cost information, that means you are going into the market and you are trying to establish on market research basis what the selling price should be. Whereas costs tend to be the dominant factor in cost plus pricing. Further, attraction is that the approach requires the collaboration of product designers, product engineers, marketing and finance staff. So comparing this target costing to the cost plus pricing, whereas in cost plus pricing, the cost is the dominant factor. You take the cost, you estimate the total cost, that includes the variable as well as the fixed. You have to find some basis of allocating the fixed to the units. And then once you have the complete cost, then you add uh, a markup for profit, a markup for uh, facility charges to arrive at an overall price. So in cost plus pricing, cost is the dominating factor. Here, in target costing, the market-driven factors are determining the selling price. This is, we have said, the main difference between cost plus and target costing. Target costing is most suited for setting prices for non-customized and high sales volume products. So we have said that this is more suited for non-customized and high volume product. Non-customized meaning general available to public and therefore the, the price can be determined from the market. The reason for this is that market research can be reliable that can provide good information. So the price is obtained from the market and then the cost is set uh, which is desirable. Now we have said that in setting up this cost and meeting the target cost, there is a challenge to management, there is a challenge to all the managers and therefore there needs to be good coordination among the various different departments in the organization, the engineering, and the production, the marketing, the finance, all need to arrive at ways in which to reduce cost and to arrive at the target cost. So the product can be re-engineered, redesigned, and the materials and etc. can be changed, manner in which production is carried out can be changed. And those are all 
opportunities for all these various uh, organization departments to get together and coordinate and work closely and their working closely is going to provide the best results for the organization. So target costing more or less brings them together in which they can work closely together. Short term product mix decisions. Price taking firms will be faced with opportunities of taking short term business at a market determined selling price. Price taking don't forget we said are those firms which are small firms and they are going to be in a position where they do not dictate prices and they accept market prices. So they will be faced with opportunities of taking short term business at a market determined selling price. In such situations accept short term business where incremental sales revenue exceeds short run incremental costs. So this is what we have said earlier that in the short term the price takers will be faced with short term decisions and they will be given a price. And so if they are faced with opportunities of one of type, of one of kind, then those decisions will normally need to be made on the basis of incremental costs. Where incremental revenue exceeds incremental costs, those are the projects or agreements that these companies will enter into. However, as mentioned earlier in the course, such business is acceptable under certain conditions and these are described as follows. Sufficient capacity is available for all resources required. If some resources are fully utilized, opportunity cost of the scarce resource must be covered in the selling price. So this short term decision making we have discussed before and we have set out certain conditions under which these firms need to take these short term decisions. If you are taking short term decisions uh, based on special orders then certain conditions have been set out that does not therefore affect the ongoing business. And one of the conditions we said was that there has to be sufficient capacity and sufficient resources are, are available to meet this short term requirement. If all the resources we said were fully utilized then we must look at the opportunity cost of the resources that have been utilized. It may be that those resources are earning profits in other ventures and therefore to sacrifice those profits for another project those profits must therefore be added to the cost of the new ventures. So those opportunity costs must be included as part of the price in the new ventures where these uh, special opportunities have arisen. The company will not commit itself to repeat long term business that is priced to cover only short term incremental costs. Here again we are saying that the company must not commit itself to short term business where the long term price uh, can be affected. You are going to cover in this short term your incremental costs. The incremental costs will not of course be the full cost. So therefore you expect only to make a marginal contribution based on the fact that the total fixed costs are going to be covered by an ongoing business which is uh, continuing normally. And so if you are going to continue to have business covering only the incremental and short term costs then very soon the company will not be able to sustain itself as the fixed costs will not be covered and losses will be incurred. Order will utilize unused capacity only for a short period and capacity will be released for use on more profitable opportunities. Note in the longer term capacity constraints can be removed. These are short term decisions we have said they are not to be considered as long term decisions and these are going to be opportunities which can be seized when better opportunities arise. Of course we must remember that in the long run all the costs of fixed nature or the restraints uh, that are faced in resources they can be overcome. So in the longer run 
no resources are limited uh, theoretically at least no resources should be limited as the company is able to increase and uh, and fund and manufacture uh, in the long run quantities that are required and provide the available resources that may be required for that production long run product mix decisions in the longer term a firm can adjust the supply of resources committed to a product therefore sales revenue from the product should exceed the cost of all resources committed to it hence there is a need to undertake periodic profitability analysis to distinguish between profitable and non profitable products now if you look at the long term then in the long term of course uh, a different situation arises you are not faced with the kind of constraints that you faced earlier and so in the long run the companies will take a different view they will need to cover all the costs that are being incurred so in the long run they have to find the prices and uh, they have to find the price levels which are going to cover the full cost and not just the incremental cost so longer run run decisions are entirely different there the perspective is uh, is entirely different it's wider uh, it covers all aspects of the organization it covers all the costs activity based profitability analysis should be used to evaluate each product's long run profitability there could be various ways in which profitability is examined now in the long run we will need to make periodic profitability analysis it will be important to continually examine which products are making profits and which are not so the profitability analysis provides this information and this uh, decision making uh, efforts the use of activity based uh, costing makes it easier to analyze the different costs at different levels so there is a strong case therefore that in the longer run the basis of costing should be activity based periodically you will need to continue to review whether or not you are covering the full cost so the costing system needs to provide current and proper fully full and accurate information that is essential to continue to review the product's profitability and that is going to provide information for making decisions like discontinuation or like product mix changes or like uh, diversification etc under this products are the cost objects in four different hierarchical levels unit brand product line and whole business we have discussed this earlier so the activity basis is going to consider the cost at different levels and the four different levels we considered were the unit the batch the product level sustaining level and the facility sustaining level most decisions are likely to be made at the individual product level before discontinuing other alternatives and considerations are taken into account sometimes it is important to maintain a full product line for marketing reasons so the long range decisions will be in a different light and many different factors will be involved and especially the discontinuing decisions will need to be carefully considered and many other factors will need to be considered uh, when such decisions are being made uh, alternative uses alternative products changes in product mix etc and before discontinuing uh, the company will also need to consider its overall marketing strategy sometimes a marketing strategy strategy dictates that a product should continue and a complete range should be provided to the customer in order to keep the customer if that is his need it may may be a danger of losing customers if you don't provide them with the full range and there may be a danger they will move to other suppliers so marketing strategies can sometimes also determine whether a product should be continued or discontinued other options considered before discontinuing products include reengineering 
or redesigning the products to reduce their resource consumption. So we have discussed this earlier that before taking a decision such as the discontinuing decision, it will be necessary to examine various aspects of continuing this production. Uh, the customer's or the product's design can be examined. There could be a redesigning. There could be a re-engineering of the product uh, which reduces costs and therefore it makes it profitable at any given price. There are various ways in which uh, products can be changed and there are engineering efforts that are needed to refine and dictate the kind of materials that are used uh, which are more cost efficient and somehow if the product can be made more cost efficient uh, then it will be possible to continue uh, its production for the company and still achieve profits. Where products are discontinued, overall profitability will improve only if managers eliminate spending on supply of activity resources no longer required. This is another aspect that was covered that when you decide to discontinue a, a product, then in order to have a cash flow impact, managers must reduce the supply of resources that were no longer to be used. If you reduce the supply of resources, then there will be a cash flow impact and the, and the result and benefit will be to the company. Otherwise, there is, as we saw before, a chance of reducing the usage but not reducing the cost. If you reduce the cost and the resource remains unused, then the, then the cost is going to be incurred. When you reduce the usage of the resource, but not the cost of the resource and not the supply of the resource, then the company still continues to incur that cost. So in order to ensure that a cash flow impact is felt, then the supply of the resource needs to be reduced. Cost plus pricing. Companies used cost bases and markups to determine their selling price. They can use different markups at different points in their cost structure to arrive at what the price could be. Here we see direct variable cost is 200, direct non-variable cost is 100, so total direct cost is 300. The companies could use a markup based on direct variable cost. And if, if that were so, and they use a markup of 250%, the price would be 500. At the same time, the total direct cost can be used as a basis to set their selling price. And here, if 70% of the markup is attached to direct cost of 300, the price would be 510. Continuing along, the cost structure indirect cost of 80 to give a total cost excluding the higher level sustaining costs of 380. If this is used as a basis, a 40% markup is added on, the price would be 532. And finally, the higher level sustaining costs of 60, when they are added, the total cost comes to 440. The markup of 20% on this cost will give a price of 528. So this slide shows that along the cost structure of the company, a markup can be used at different levels and different bases to arrive at what the price would be. We have said the cost plus pricing is a structure where cost is the basis, a markup is added on to arrive at the final price. So as we saw in the example, the markup can be used at the direct cost level, at the total cost level, at the total cost before the higher cost levels, and at the final total cost. Different markups can be added, and then that can give uh, an estimate of price. And it will depend on the company which cost it, rega it regards as most appropriate to set as a, a basis for setting its price. Establishing a target markup percentage. Markups are related to demand. Firms are able to command a higher markup for a product that has high demand. Markups are likely to decrease when competition is intense. So now when we look at establishing an appropriate markup percentage, 
it may be that a higher percentage can be set where products are unusual, where the position of the company in the market is slightly uh, in a premier category. So where there is higher demand and low turnover, there it is possible to have a higher price. And it might be more appropriate where the, where the demand is low to have a lower price. Especially in cases of intense competition. Competition very often is a key factor in determining the markup percentage also. Where the competition is intense, it is unlikely that any one customer, any one supplier will be able to charge a high markup rate as the others will not and the customers will choose the substitute and the alternative and this company would lose its sales volume. Markups are likely to decrease when competition is intense. Luxury goods with low sales turnover may attract high profit margins whereas non-luxury goods with high sales turnover may not. Another approach to choose a markup is to earn a target rate of return on capital investment. Charging a markup, if we are dealing with luxury goods, it might be a different matter. Chances are that in luxury goods, the markup can be high, whereas in non-luxury goods, the market can be low. The competition is likely to be more intense in non-luxury goods. They are likely to be more of a general type, not requiring uh, that much uh, specialized technology and skills and so therefore there the markup is likely to be low whereas for luxury goods we said that it's possible to charge a higher markup another approach to markup is that you could decide that you can uh, set a rate of return on the capital employed on the investments made whatever is the investment you want to have a return on that investment and you can base it on that. On that. We can see that in an example. If the cost per unit of a product is 100 and annual volume is 10,000, product requires investment of rupees 1 million and the target rate of return is 15%, the target markup will be 15% into 1 million divided by 10,000 units which gives rupees 15 per unit. As the cost was 100, the target price will be 100 plus 15, which is 115. So here is an example of setting the return on investment as a possible market rate. In our example, the investment was 1 million, the number of units produced were 10,000, and the price was, and the cost was 100. To get a return of 15% on 1 million, you will take 15% of 1 million and divide that by the 10,000 units you expect to, expect to produce, that will give you the return that you require from each unit. In our case, that turned out to be 15 and therefore a target price can be set at 115. The major problem with this approach is that it is difficult to determine the capital invested to support a product. Assets are normally used for many different products. This is a problem in this uh, method. It may not be possible to accurately determine what is the investment for each product. Usually assets are deployed and they produce a range of products. There could be a set of machinery. Of course there's going to be a facility, the land and buildings, which are going to be common and therefore a lot of investment is common to many products. So this is the problem in trying to identify the rate of return and use the rate of return as a basis for of markup for the pricing. Common costs, common fixed costs make it difficult to identify exactly the amount of investment in any one product. Management should use this information together with their knowledge of the market and intended pricing strategies before the final price is set. So this information on what would be a rate of return required 
and what would be based on the investment within the product. That kind of information can be used as a guide and many other factors will need to be considered in trying to set a final price. So the final price that is being set will incorporate several different factors and we said using the cost plus pricing, uh, establishing a percentage is one way and to establish the percentage of markup, you can use the rate of return on investment as one guide. Limitations of cost plus pricing. The main criticism against cost plus pricing is that it ignores demand for the product. It is assumed that prices should solely depend on cost. We have been using cost plus basis for trying to find the price and use that as a basis for pricing our product. The criticism of cost plus basis is that it ignores demand. It just uses cost and assume that you can base on your cost and add on a markup and charge that as a price. There is no reference to what the demand would be, how the price can be changed, if the demand changes and things like that. For example, a cost plus formula may suggest rupees 20 for product where the demand is 100,000 units. Whereas, at a price of rupees 25, the demand may be 80,000 units. Assuming that variable cost for each unit sold is 15, the total contribution will be 500,000 at price of 20 and 800,000 at the price of 25. This example demonstrates, therefore, that using cost plus, you might make a wrong decision. Cost plus indicates that a price of 20 where your cost is 15 and you, you are selling 100,000 units. That is giving a contribution of 500,000 and that would be a decision. Whereas market information and demand information would tell you that if you reduced and if you increase the price from 20 to 25, the demand will reduce from 100,000 to 80,000 but still give you a higher contribution of 800,000 compared to the 500,000. Thus, the cost plus pricing formula might lead to incorrect decisions. Cost plus can give rise to a loss if the volume is insufficient and contribution does not cover fixed cost. So these are the limitations of the cost plus formula. Cost plus is giving you a cost and a suggested price, but it is not relating you to the demand. And so if the quantity that is being sold at that price is insufficient, then there might be a situation where the fixed costs are not being covered by the contribution. This is the danger of cost plus pricing and therefore it needs to be used with some consideration and care. That's all for this lecture. Thank you very much.